You may have heard of the giants built by Nazi Germany during the Second World War. The battleships Bismarck and her twin brother, Tirpitz, were unmatched in size, weight and firepower to any ship built by the Allies. The displacement of each of these twins was about 50,000 tons when fully loaded. To have an idea of what this means, it is enough to take into account that this displacement is equivalent to that of the French aircraft carrier Charles de Gaulle, with about 40,000 tons, slightly lower than that of the Russian aircraft carrier Admiral Kuznetsov, with about 57,000 tons, and equivalent to half the displacement of U.S. Gerald Ford-class aircraft carriers. However, we are talking about ships from the 1940s, not these monsters of today. The giants of the German Navy started operation in 1939. The battleship Tirpitz was launched by Adolf Hitler himself. They were the biggest warships of the German Navy. In places, its armor measured an impressive 118 inches of steel. Their weaponry was varied. The Tirpitz, for example, was armed with 838cm caliber cannons, secondary artillery, and an anti-aircraft defense system. The 15-inch guns were paired in four turrets, named Anton and Bruno at the bow, and Caesar and Dora at the stern. Each 15-inch caliber cannon launched grenades that weighed 1,760 pounds each. They were about the height of a man and could reach about 22 miles away. Secondary artillery consisted of 12 6-inch guns in 6 turrets, 16 4-inch guns, plus 16 1.5-inch anti-aircraft guns and 80 0.8-inch rapid-fire guns. Tirpitz also carried four Arado AR-196 seaplanes. After the outbreak of World War II in 1939, England found itself in a difficult situation where its food and other supplies depended on maritime traffic. Knowing this vulnerability of the British, Hitler decided to undermine this supply, ordering his submarines and warships to sink the merchant ships that were heading to England. The British Navy was able to fight submarines and combat ships similar in size to its own. However, the Bismarck and Tirpitz were far superior in size and weaponry. An example of this difference was the encounter of Bismarck with the Hood, a battleship that was the pride of the British Navy, in the Battle of Denmark Strait in May 1941. One of Bismarck's 15-inch cannon salvos caused a large explosion in the hood, with lots of smoke. When the smoke cleared, the British ship was no more. Naval combat in the Denmark Strait caused the British Navy to attribute disproportionate capabilities to the two large German battleships. There was the impression that it would be practically impossible to defeat the two giants through a traditional confrontation. After the fighting in the Denmark Strait, Bismarck was continually attacked by ships and British aviation. After fighting virtually single-handedly against a large number of enemies, Bismarck had his rudder damaged, losing his ability to maneuver. Finally, on May 27, 1941, Bismarck was sunk in the North Atlantic. After the desperate experience against Bismarck, the attention of the British turned to Tripitz, which was off the coast of Norway. They could not let him act against the merchant ships that supplied England through traffic in the North Atlantic. Now, how to defeat the German giant Tirpitz? The solution did not lie in direct confrontation, but in exploiting a vulnerability on the German ship. In early 1942, the prospect of Tirpitz patrolling the Atlantic was horrifying for the Allied convoys supplying Britain. 
British Prime Minister Winston Churchill now had only one thing on his mind, to neutralize this giant of the seas. Since the beginning of the war, the German Navy had been sowing terror in the Atlantic. German submarines, or U-boats, relentlessly attacked supply convoys bound for Britain. The obvious solution devised was to sink it. The best way to achieve this would be to lure him, or force him, to leave his Norwegian refuge. But after the Hood tragedy, the British knew very well the risk and cost of such an offensive action. So, instead of attacking the Tirpitz directly, how could the British stop it from interfering with the maritime traffic that supplied the British war effort? The solution quickly manifested itself. To prevent the Tirpitz from moving into the Atlantic, they had to eliminate all repair or maintenance opportunities along the coastline controlled by Third Reich forces. Fortunately for the Allies, there was only one dock large enough to house the 250-yard, 50,000-ton behemoth outside Germany, Joubert's Lock at St. Nazaire. It had, at each end, rolling doors made of steel. At 57 yard in length and 12 yard in depth, the two doors operated by sliding sideways, opening and closing, by means of rolling carts, instead of opening and closing like a set of normal double doors. Its size, versatility and the modernity of its equipment have made this unique pier the ideal refuge for a ship the size of the Tirpitz in the Atlantic. The possibility of offensive action against St. Nazir was considered by Churchill. He was confident he could count on a man he saw as dynamic and imaginative, Vice Admiral L.O.U.S. Mountbatten, who, at 41 years of age, had been appointed by the Prime Minister as head of combined operations in October 1941. Shortly after taking over the reins of combined operations, he conceived and launched a commando attack on Norway. Operation Archery was a combined operations attack against German positions on the Norwegian island of Vaxo on December 27, 1941. The operation was a great success, allowing British commandos to capture the German naval encryption system not only for the ships of the Kriegsmarine based in Norway, but also for those in France. Joint operations had one more secret weapon at their disposal, a model of the port of St. Nazir, made for them by the modeling division of the photographic reconnaissance section of the Royal Air Force, the British Air Force. There was also a German submarine base at St. Nazir. Its concrete construction prevented this base from being destroyed by aerial bombardments. The base ceiling alone was 138 inches thick of concrete. The British reflected on the problem and found a solution. While they couldn't necessarily destroy the base, they could put it out of action by destroying the floodgates leading to the dock. This would make it impossible for the Tirpitz to undergo maintenance in the Atlantic. With no maintenance available, it could not remain in operation for long, nor could it be repaired. Therefore, being without maintenance meant, in practice, being prevented from operating in the medium and long term. In the end, 24 objectives were selected. The destruction of the two gigantic dock doors remained the top priority, followed by the neutralization of the other six locks, as well as four bridges, six power stations and six artillery batteries. There were 6,000 Germans occupying St. Nazir. The local population was around 50,000. An amphibious incursion against St. Nazir would only succeed if it combined surprise and attack power. It was vital that the Germans had their attention diverted while the British made their long and dangerous advance into the harbor. The solution was an aerial bombardment long enough and fierce enough to monopolize the enemy's attention during the assault on the port area. Information provided by the local resistance and photographs taken by British reconnaissance aircraft convinced joint operations that no means of destruction could reduce the dock's massive steel sliding doors.
To get around this problem, the elaborate plan called for an old, low-draft destroyer, loaded with explosives at the front and carrying the commandos. He would push through the torpedo net that protected the Joubert lock before crashing open the dock. Meanwhile, the commandos would disembark from faster and smaller vessels and proceed to destroy hydraulic pumps, generators and other targets that allowed the dock to work. Aerial bombardment would take the attention of enemy artillery, searchlights and radar, starting before the ships enter the estuary and continuing throughout the assault. As for the destroyer used as a battering ram, it would explode after the men disembarked on board thanks to a system of time bombs. Once the operation was over, the commandos and crew of the sacrifice destroyer would be picked up by a second destroyer. The operation was codenamed Chariot. As a battering ram, Campbelltown was selected, built in the United States in 1918. However, it would be a suicidal action to approach St. Nazir with Campbelltown in its original configuration. To fool the Germans, they had to make it look like one of the German Navy ships operating in French Atlantic ports. To do this, British engineers began by removing two of its four chimneys, the rest were tilted back. In addition to changing its appearance, it was necessary to make the vessel lighter so that it could cross the estuary shallows without sinking. Campbelltown was loaded with five tons of explosives. At 1400 hours on Thursday, March 26, 1942, the flotilla of speedboats departed Falmouth Harbor, escorted by an Royal Air Force fighter flying at low altitude. An hour later, it was Campbelltown's turn and the two escort destroyers to drop anchor. They formed the 10th Anti-Submarine Strike Force, a fictional unit ostensibly formed to hunt submarines. Campbelltown and two escort destroyers hoisted the German Navy flag to deceive the German Air Force. Shortly after, a suspicious vessel was spotted. It was actually a German submarine coming to the surface. The submarine did not realize that they were English ships and remained on the surface of the sea until the English ships replaced the German flag with the English one and opened fire on it. The submarine evaded and managed to send an alert to its headquarters, which did not take the news about the British vessels seriously, imagining that they were small ships on a mining mission. Without major problems, the vessels managed to follow their course and reached St. Nazir. The aerial bombardment had begun at the predicted time, and it helped the British vessels advance closer to the dock. However, the cover was blown and the Germans opened fire on the British ships, which continued their advance at full speed. Campbelltown was thrown against the dock, at the predicted point, where it crashed brutally and remained stranded, preventing the use of the dock. The commandos landed at various points in the base and headed towards their objectives, amidst a great firefight. The objectives were almost fully achieved, at great cost, to the British. Of the total of 611 Britons, including sailors and commandos, 169 lives were lost and 232 prisoners of war taken. While British prisoners were being interrogated by the Germans, shortly after the attack on St. Nazir ended, Campbelltown remained stranded on the outside of the dock, still making it impossible to use it. Several German soldiers were inside, to carry out investigations or out of curiosity. Unexpectedly, the ship exploded. The load of five tons of explosives, which had been started in the initial moments of the assault on the base, exploded as predicted, instantly killing between 150 and 380 people, in addition to putting the dock out of use until 1947. The Tirpitz could never be sent for operations in the Atlantic. As with the Bismarck, she was destroyed by the Royal Air Force in 1944 in the Norwegian fjords. 
Although it is now known that the Germans had no intention of using the Tirpitz in the Atlantic, the chariot operation was entirely justifiable because it took away the Germans' freedom of choice, restricting the use of a strategic weapon that could jeopardize the British war effort. The use of German flags by the British could not take place today, as it would possibly materialize a war crime. It is provided for in Article 39 of the Additional Protocol to the Geneva Conventions of 1957. However, at the time of the amphibious incursion into St. Nazir, there was no international agreement condemning this practice. Therefore, taking into account the context of the time, it is up to each one to make his own judgment about the use of German flags by the British at that time. The St. Nazir episode shows how to defeat a giant. If you can't fight him directly, you can attack him indirectly, where there is some dependency or vulnerability, and defeat him. There are theories of war that address this issue, dealing with the exploration of opposing centers of gravity. Este vídeo é dedicado a todos aqueles que pereceram durante o assalto a San Nazir. If you like this video, don't forget to press the like button, subscribe to the channel, turn on notifications, and write down your comments. Share it with your friends. This is very important for the growth of the channel and to produce more videos about world military history. See you in the next video. Goodbye.